How valuable are my friends? And the value you place on your friends will be evidenced by the way you treat your friends. Nothing you say, it's the way you treat them. And the wonderful thing about friendship is this. Jesus is the best friend you and I'll ever have. Today on In Touch, thinking through your friendships. The Lord has a plan for every single one of our lives. And part of that plan is he has friendships for each of us because he does not want us to live the life of like an island all by ourselves. And many people have trusted Jesus Christ as their personal Savior as a result of a friend who introduced them to Jesus. Many people will tell you that going through the most difficult time of their life, it was their friend who helped them through it. The other people who will tell you, I had a friend, but I don't know what happened to that friendship. Friends are treasures. They are gifts from God. And if you have a true, genuine friend, you should be very grateful. When I try to think about what a true friend is like, I think about something I read many years ago. I don't know who wrote it, but I copied it down, and it came to my mind the other day. I thought, well, this is the kind of friend I'd like to be. This is the kind of friend I'd like to have. And so I want to share that with you. And I'm going to put it up line by line on the screen so you can copy it down. But I want you to copy it for this reason. I think it's the kind of friend you'd like to have. And I'm sure it's the kind of friend you'd like to be. So let's look at it. A treasure. One who loves you as you are, no matter what's going on. One who sees not only who you are, but who you can become. One who is there to catch you when you fall. And one with whom you can share your everyday experiences. One who accepts your worst, but helps you to become your best. Someone who understands your past, believes in your future, and accepts you today just the way you are. Someone who comes in when the world, the whole world, has gone out. Think about that. So just for our sake, why don't we all just repeat that together and just sort of get it in our minds. You ready? Let's start. A treasure, one who loves you as you are. One who sees not only who you are, but who you can become. One who's there to catch you when you fall. One with whom you can share your everyday experiences. And one who accepts your worst, but helps you to become your best. Someone who understands your past, believes in your future, and accepts you today just the way you are. Someone who comes in when the whole world has gone out. I think all of us would agree we need those kind of friends. And so I'd ask you this question. Are you that kind of friend to someone? Do you have a friend who is that to you? When you read that and you realize what is involved, you realize why a friend is a treasure, a gift from God. And we all need friendships. And the Bible says a lot about friendships, and especially, for example, in the book of Proverbs. And as I was thinking about the kind of friendships we have, and think about, for example, the friendships all of us have had that we've enjoyed, friendships that we've trusted, friendships that we've believed in, and friendships that we hope to at last all of our life. And yet somewhere along the way, something happens to them. We get disappointed. They walk away. We don't know why. Sometimes they tell us, and most of the time they probably don't. So they're all kind of friendships. And what you and I need is a friendship. We need to have a friendship with the Lord Jesus Christ, first of all, who will equip us and enable us to be the kind of friends we need to be. And people will be attracted to us because of our friendship with them. 
and will want to be the same kind of friend to us. Who in your life could you count today as being a true, genuine, loving, faithful, loyal, devoted, trustworthy friend? Many people cannot name one single person because they've been hurt, they've been disappointed, they look at things that's happened in their past, and they have been hurt so terribly they could not ever trust again. At least that's what they will tell you. The truth is they could if they'd be willing to. So when I think about uh, troubled friendships, I think about in this light, and that is uh, sometimes we form wrong friendships. And the book of Proverbs is very clear about who we choose to be our friends. And somebody says, well, if you're a Christian, uh, can't you choose anybody to be your friend? Well, what does the Word of God say? So I'm going to give you these scriptures, and I'm going to read them to you so you won't have to look them up. it take too long. But uh, first of all, the Scripture is very clear about the kind of friendships we should not have. And the first one is this. The Bible says in Proverbs 20, verse 19, do not associate with a gossip. Listen, not only don't make friends with the gossips, don't even have anything to do with them. You say, oh, I don't believe Jesus feels that way. Well, um, the Bible says don't don't have any relationship with a gossip. Now, why would God say such a thing? Because, first of all, you can't trust a gossip. You can't trust them to say anything, that you can tell them anything to keep a confidence, because the one thing a gossip loves above everything else is to be the one who has the final word on you and who can tell what they want to tell about you. A gossip is a dangerous kind of friendship. So God says don't, ha don't have anything to do with a gossip. The second one is, don't, uh, listen, he says, don't associate with a person who's hot-tempered. They just blow off all of a sudden. In Proverbs 22, verse 24 and 25, do not associate with a man or a woman given to anger or go with a hot-tempered man, or you will learn his ways and find a snare for yourself. What he's saying is this, when you, when you associate with people who have very definite negative attitudes and effects in life, he says, if you, if you hang around them and you associate with them, more than likely, they're going to influence you. And the Bible says that in a number of different ways, that the influence of the ungodly is powerful. And somebody will often say, well, you know, uh, I'm going to marry this person because I'm going to change him. You just think you are. And or uh, if I live a Christian life before them, they will certainly change. Not always. And so he says, he says, be careful about people who are gossips. Be careful about people who are hot-tempered. And he says in uh, chapter 24 of Proverbs, he says, listen, do not associate with those given to change, for their calamity will suddenly arise, which is what he means is those who are disloyal and discontent. If a person's discontent, they're always changing. You don't, you don't know whether you can trust them or not. Today you think you can, tomorrow you know you can't. And so a person who is discontent, unsettled in their ways. He said, watch those people because they'll influence you. In Proverbs 28, verse 7, he warns us about people who are self-indulgent. You know, too much of this, too much of that, too much of that. The only thing they want is what satisfies them or what seemingly uh, satisfies them at the moment. Proverbs 28, 7, he who keeps the law is a discerning person. That is, they're under control. But he who is a companion of gluttons humiliates his father. That is a person, it's all about them. It's all that they can do that satisfies them. It, it don't have anything to do with those kind of people. Then the immoral in uh, chapter 29, verse 3, he says, He who keeps company with harlots wastes wealth. And it's interesting in the fifth chapter of uh, Proverbs, of all the things uh, the Lord says about all different kind of people, in the fifth chapter of the Proverbs, he goes on for about 11 verses about uh, giving attention to wisdom and being discreet and watching out for an adulteress or an adulterer. And he describes what they do and what happens as a result. And so he says, keep yourself away from them. Don't, don't even head in that direction. Don't give thought to that. And so he gives us fair warning in Proverbs chapter 5. Stay away from it. In other words, you can't, this, in other words, you say, the Bible says you can't take fire into your bosom without being burned. So if you want to get in trouble, then you have friendships 
that are troubling friendships that absolutely will tear you down and not build you up. And then he says, for example, in Proverbs 13, 20, he who walks with wise men will be wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. And the Bible says a fool is a person who does not believe in God. A fool says there is no God, but fools also, listen, are those who do not accept the Lord, who shut God out of their life. They're fools. They're foolish because they're trying to live their life apart from God. So when somebody says, well, yes, uh, I know he's not a Christian, but I'm going to marry him and I'm going to get him saved. I'll tell you what, you have to be very careful who you marry. And even if you marry a Christian, it doesn't mean it's going to last. And in this day and time, half the people who get married, it doesn't last. And it looks like it's almost getting ready to increase. But the issue is this. We're talking about friendships. So don't even get, in, don't even get into a friendship. And if somebody does not believe in God, you say, well, how am I going to win anybody to Jesus without being their friend? I'll tell you how. You can confront them with the gospel of Jesus Christ in a loving way. That doesn't mean, listen, you can have a relationship without a friendship. And some friendships are dangerous. And so you can witness to somebody and be loving and kind without developing a friend. When that person becomes a friend. Uh, you ought to have friends of people who are loyal, devoted, who love the same God you love and walk the same way you walk. Because if you don't, according to the Scripture, you're going to be highly influenced by other people. And usually it's the wrong kind of influence. So very, very clear what the Scripture says. In fact, he says, the way of a fool is right in his own eyes, naturally. But a fool is an arrogant and careless person, always losing his temper and so forth. So unless we are unusually strong, you don't try to develop friends with people who are heading in the opposite direction than you are spiritually. If you've trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you're born again. The Lord Jesus Christ is your Savior, your Lord, your Master. He has a plan for your life. It's the best plan, a good plan. You do not want to link your life up with somebody who has no plan, someone who does not accept the fact that God has a plan, and someone who's not interested in God's plan for his own life or her own life or your life. And so would you say, well, are you telling me not, don't marry somebody who's not a Christian? That's what I'd say. I'd say it absolutely. And so I know that many people would say, well, that's not Scripture. Read the Word of God. If you just keep reading, you'll find the warning is that you will be highly influenced by people who are ungodly. It doesn't mean you can't have relationships, godly relationships, but to develop a friendship. And a friendship is a tight relationship. A friendship is more than just a relationship. And so the Scripture warns us about it because of the absolutely evident impact of that which oftentimes tears a person down. How many people have started out and then got into relationships? How many parents have said to their children, I don't feel good about that person. I don't feel good. And listen, if you're a young person, I'll just put it this way. Most of the time, probably about 98% of the time, if a parent who loves you says to you, I don't feel good about this particular person, you better listen. Because I've lived long enough. I've lived long enough to have watched over and over and over and over again when parents have warned their children. They say, but you don't really know him. You don't really know her. And maybe months later or a few years later, they say, I wish I had listened to you. When somebody says, I wish I had, or when somebody says, if I had, they're confessing a disappointment in life. You don't want that in your life. You don't want that in your children's life. And you certainly don't want that in your husband or wife's life. And when a husband says to his wife, you know, I don't have a good feeling about you being with her. I don't have a good feeling about you going out with her. You would listen to your husband. If uh, she says, I don't have you, I don't like the idea of you running around with him. I don't think that I don't have a good feeling about that because God has said something to her about what he sees in that person. And listen, many good people with great intention have wrecked and ruined their life by being influenced in a negative fashion. They didn't intend to be. They wanted to do the best. They were going to be something good in that life, person's life. They're a good influence, and the opposite happened. We have to be careful about our friendships. And to be careless can be oftentimes disastrous. And I would ask you a question. 
Are you here this morning? Are you sitting there, maybe by yourself in your apartment? The only reason you've listened to this part is when I said something about not having friends, because you don't. If you don't have a friend, you are very lonely. And no amount of alcohol, no amount of money, no amount of prestige and popularity can fill the place of Jesus in your life who will be with you no matter what. Friendships are very valuable to us. We have to take care of them. And so we make decisions in life, and what happens as a result? We ruin a good friendship. And so it has to be nurtured, and, and it's, uh, we can make unwise relationships, friendships, or wise ones. So let's think about uh, uh, how you make friendships. We you say, well, you know, you just meet somebody and decide they'd be a good friend. You, that's not the way you have friendships. Watch this carefully. You have to build friendships. Relationships can come and go. Friendships you have to build. You say, well, how do you build the friendships? I'm going to give you a list. Every single word in this list is very important. If you want to have real, genuine friendships that really make a difference in your life, first of all, you have to spend time with them. In other words, you can't have friendships that you don't have time with that person. Spend time with them. Secondly, talk to them. That's the second most important. You have to talk to them. How do you, how do you develop friendships? You learn who the other person is. How do you learn who the other person is? When they tell you about their life, uh, they tell you, first of all, what they want you to know. The more you, friendships you develop, they tell you things about their life that they probably thought they wouldn't tell anybody. They become very, very honest. And so talking to each other is what builds friendships. And I talk to some of my friends, and I have some wonderful, wonderful, wonderful godly friends. I talk to some of them every single day. Friendships you have to give time to. You want to give time to. Why? They make you laugh. They bring you happiness. They encourage you. That is, if you're going to be a friend, you've got to be willing to talk and to listen to the other person. And likewise, as you, you've got to be willing to cry and willing to laugh. All of us go through situations and circumstances that are heartbreaking. And if you're the kind of person that watch this, you have to watch this one. If you're the kind of person who lives like this, you, you, you will never have any friends because you're trying to cover up something in your life that you need to share. In other words, when your heart's broken, you need to tell it. You need to share it with someone who's a real friend. You get disappointed either by your friends or your, at work or your children or something, and we laugh together and we cry together. That's what real, genuine friendships are all about. Somebody says, well, now, men don't cry. Well, you'll die early <laughs> for the simple reason because... If crying is one way we release tension and stress in our life. And listen, the Bible says Jesus did what? He wept. He cried. All of us that are natural, we're going to cry at some things. True, genuine friendships, you're willing to cry. You're willing to share your heart no matter what. Then, of course, there are those things that you accomplish in life, and, and uh, you, maybe you get a raise, or you get a promotion, or or you get some recognition and so forth, you share that with your friends, and what happens? If they're true friends, they're just as excited about what you get as if they got it. That's true, genuine friendships, that willing to compliment you, what, whatever's going on in life. And then, of course, there are trials. All of us are going to have trials in life. We're going to go through things that are very difficult. If you're a real friend, you'll be there when the trials come. If you're a true friend, you're going to share what you're going through in life. And if you try to be the kind of friend who has no troubles, no heartaches, no burdens, no this, you got everything and everything is just fine, that's not friendship. That is a dishonest cover-up. That's what that is. We all have trials we go through in life, some more intense than others. But what, what do we do to keep them to ourselves? No. We tell God about them first, and then if we have a friend, we share that. Not to burden somebody else. And you see, listen, if I'm your friend and you're my friend and you come unload on me, I don't consider that a burden. I'm grateful to God that you felt free to tell me what was going on in your life. And, and what happens is this. The, the more genuine that friendship is, the more intimate you're going to be willing to share. Things that in your life that maybe you wouldn't share with anybody. And it may be that it's the only person you would tell. But that's part of friendships. And then, of course... A thankfulness. Think about this. When's the last time you said to your friend, thanks? 
When's the, ever, when's the last time you sent a text, since it's a text age? When's the last time you sent him a text and just said, I was just thinking about you this morning. I don't want to thank you for being my friend. Now, you say, well, that's not very, that's not very long. You know how I send texts, and I don't like to send them? I will send them, and if, and if I just say, uh, I just want to, you to know that I love you, you know what I do? And to emphasize that, I put about five, six, seven, or ten exclamation points behind it. <laughs> Because what I'm saying is, I really and truly love you, I do. <laughs> so I don't know how to say that in a text message any other way. But you know what? Sometimes that's all people need. I'm praying for you this morning, exclamation point, exclamation point. Words, it means what it says to me, I really mean it. So that's my way of saying I really mean it in case you question that. So being thankful and then being thoughtful. And there are all different kinds of ways to be thoughtful to somebody. And whether it's you, whether you tell them that you're grateful for something they did, or as we say, text them, or you write them a note. But I think a little note doesn't take long to say, thank you very much. That was thoughtful of you. Thanks. How could you be, how could you be so thoughtful? In other words, it doesn't take much. And, and what happens is this. When you are thoughtful and you express it, something happens. First of all, something happens re that re is released in you emotionally. And secondly, well, listen, it's released in you and lifts the other person. It's like a smile. For example, let's say that you're sort of down in the dumps and somebody it comes to see you about whatever it might be. Next thing you know, they've been smiling and here you're smiling and, you, and they've lifted you up. That's what friends should do. They should lift each other, whatever it takes. And oftentimes it takes very, very little, just being thoughtful. Or it may be that you're thoughtful by giving them something that you know they want. And we, we live in a selfish age. It doesn't take much to express thoughtfulness. Just a little something here and there. And we're expressing appreciation and love uh, and our kindness toward the other person. Then, of course, there's tolerance. In other words, uh, to be friends, you have to tolerate things. Nobody, nobody's perfect. Uh, we all have our failures about things. So maybe we'd say something that disappoints the other person, or maybe you say something that, that uh, hurts somebody's feelings. Uh, sometimes you can hurt somebody else's feelings when you didn't mean that at all. And when the person realizes you didn't really mean that, they tolerate that and move on and don't hold it against you. You can't, li listen, you can't live with your antennas out. Who's going to say something wrong about me today? No, it's, it's, you can't live that way. You've got to, listen, you've got to live thanking God that He loves you. He tolerates us every single day, forgives us for our mistakes. And then, of course, watch this now, touching. Touching is very important in friendships. Now, for example, I have some men friends whom I love dearly. I don't shake hands with them. It's not because I'm afraid of getting contaminated. <laughs> it's because a handshake's not enough. And you know whose hand you should shake and whom you should hug. For example, your family and uh, maybe, maybe somebody else, your, your friends. But even your friends, you have to be careful about, about how you touch somebody else. And so real friends are, are sacred in their touch. I would put it that way. Then you've got to be transparent. You've got to be open. And think about living this way. Think about living in a fashion, I don't want anybody to see on the inside of what I'm really like. And, and you see, what you may be feeling may be totally erroneous. That's not who you are. That's who you think you are. And so you think if, if, if he or she sees this, they won't like me anymore. You know what? They, they've already seen it. And you're trying to cover it up. You just have to be transparent and open who you are. And not try to be something that you're not because we're not perfect. And I remember when I was uh, coming along in high school, we had a, especially one girl in our class, came from a very rich family and this, that, and the other and so forth. And she was always looking down her nose at everybody. I will never forget this. I don't know why I'm telling you this. <laughs> one of my dear friends, <laughs> one of my dear friend <laughs> friends, <laughs> we were sitting in an English class one day, and the, and the, and the teacher asked him a question. <laughs> he said, 
look, I don't know, but she knows everything, so just ask <laughs> her. And so that's, that is the attitude and the, and the spirit, and, and I'll never forget that as long as I live, as you can tell. And so we, we develop friendships in a warm, wonderful, awesome way, but we have to be open, not snooty. And then, of course, you got to be truthful. You can't have a friendship if you're not truthful. If somebody tells you something and you say, I'm not going to tell anybody, and you do, that's not being truthful. Or if somebody asks you a question, um, maybe, maybe they ask a question about yourself. Maybe you don't want to answer it. You could say, well, you know, uh, I have to think about that. Oh, this is a time, or whatever it might be. But just be truthful. Being honest always works. And the people who are not truthful, you don't have those kind of friendships. Because when you add all those things up, to, they, they add up to love. If you love somebody, all these things are going to be found in your life. And so uh, there are oftentimes, as we said in the very beginning, friendships that start out people you trust, people you love, uh, people that you hope will be your friend for a long time, and something happens to that friendship. All of us have lost friends. And I've lost friends that I never thought I would lose. And so, uh, how do you destroy a friendship? I mean, sometimes the people die, they just move away, and whatever. But how do you destroy a friendship? What, what do you do, the things you do, that really cause a friendship to fall apart? Well, the first thing is simply this. You just be selfish. It's all about me, myself, and I, my three favorite friends. And it's what I get, what I want, when I have it, when I can get it. You want to destroy a friendship, just be selfish, always on the receiving end. A second way is to be a manipulator. You use the other person. Nobody wants to be used. You use the other person, for example, to, to get what you want in life. And uh, so uh, they feel like they're being used. You go through this person or that person, and you manipulate it. Uh, that you can destroy a friendship because you realize that's not friendship. They're using you to get something else. They're using you to get to another person. Thirdly, possessiveness. And this is why you can really kill a friendship. Watch this carefully. You can smother a relationship. You can smother a friendship to absolutely destroy it. Because if a person is your friend and you count them as a dear friend, you cannot say to them or act such a way, you can't be anybody else's friend. If you are my friend, it's just the two of us. No, that's not what friendship is about. And friendship is about sharing ourselves, not necessarily with just one person, but whoever God uh, leads you and whoever He works in your life. And so possessiveness doesn't work, and neither does jealousy. Possessiveness is not right. Jealousy is a sin. And jealousy will destroy any relationship. If you're married to a man or woman who's jealous, you're miserable. You're miserable if you're married to somebody who's jealous because this is where you have to walk. <laughs> Just like that. Because you never know when you're going to be misunderstood. Uh, you, may, you may say, well, you, you're looking wonderful today. Why did you tell her that? Or in other words, in other words a, person, a person who is jealous is never happy about anything. It's like this. They have antennas out looking for reasons not to trust or to believe in. That'll destroy a relationship. If you have, if you have a true friend, you want them to be. It's, listen, if they're that kind of friend to you, you treasure that friendship. And you want somebody else to have the same kind of friendship. Because you love somebody. If you really love them, you're not going to be jealous of them. Somebody says, well, I'm jealous, but I love them. No, 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 no. If you love them, you're not jealous of them. Jealousy says, I must be in control of you at all times. I watch what you watch. I look at what you look. In other words, that's not friendship. That's jealousy, and that is a sin. And then, of course, if somebody is always criticizing. In other words, if you live with a critic, you can't be happy. Because a critic is going to find some reason at some point, probably daily or thereabouts, uh, something you didn't do right, you could have done better. And if you live with somebody that no matter what you do is not quite good enough. It got close, but it wasn't good enough. You, you bought him or her a gift, for example, 
And uh, well, oh, where did you buy it? Well, because you didn't buy it at a very expensive place. Well, well, that doesn't say much about your love. Well, I mean, wait, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. In other words, friendship isn't based on how much the gift cost. Friendship's based on the fact that you thought about me. And so people who are critics, they're going to find some way. Then, of course, those are, there are those people who are explosive. Uh, you, you, you don't want an explosive friend. Here's the reason why. You never know when they're going off. <laughs> you, you never know when they're going off. Because something just ticked them the wrong way, and they have this explosion. And then what happens? Oftentimes, you end up picking up the pieces, and sometimes you can't pick up the pieces. This is why you want to have friends with people who love the Lord, who know how to love you, who know how to give of themselves to you, who are trustworthy, who believe in you. And then, of course, uh, there are people who are very covetous. In other words, uh, and think about this, jealousy is the attitude that makes me grasp of what I have. That, that is, I'm jealous. But covetousness, listen, covetousness drives me to do what? To get what somebody else has. So if I'm going to have a real friendship, it's a give and take. In other words, I want to give to you, you give to me, we share each other. It's not, in other words, it's not about me. Genuine friendships is not about me, it's about you. And about your future, and about your life, and, and what brings happiness and peace and joy into your life. And then, of course, disloyalty. Disloyalty destroys a friendship immediately. I told you something in confidence, and you promised me you would not tell anybody else because it was an area of my life that I was working on, or I told you this happened in my family, or whatever it might be. Disloyalty, disloyalty is like driving a a, a stake between two people. Can't be trusted. It'll destroy a friendship. And likewise, just, just being dishonest, just not telling the truth. In other words, if you did something wrong, just say, yeah, you know what? I missed it. I'm sorry. I forgot it. And if I ask you today, how many of you have forgotten your wife or your husband's birthday? Please don't raise your hand. <laughs> and yet somebody... And then the other person gets all upset, and they just will say, you know what? I forgot it. You don't say, well, I was this. No, in other words, if you tried to explain some things away, you're just wasting your time. Just say, you know what? I'm sorry. I apologize. I don't know what happened. I forgot it, but it's my fault, and I will certainly try to make it up to you. Then, of course, if you want to destroy our friendship, just get too busy. Well, you know, I haven't called you in two weeks for this reason. I haven't talked to you in about a month. In other words, everybody's busy. It takes time, as we said in the very beginning, to be a real, true, genuine friend. Now, the question is, how do we, how do we rescue uh, these troubled friendships? And I'll just make this very short. How do, we, how do we rescue them? First of all, you've got to decide that a friendship is worth rescuing. You've got to decide you really want that person to be your friend. You have to decide, I'm willing to do whatever's necessary to make things right. If I've done something to offend them in some way, neglected them in some way, I'm willing to make that, take the steps necessary. And so the first thing I have to do is admit that, hey, I was wrong here. Uh, please forgive me. That was not what a loyal, devoted friend would do. And I'm asking you to forgive me, and I promise you, to the best of my ability, it'll never happen again. And then live it out, what you promise, that you'll be loyal, devoted to that person, honest and truthful. Then, of course, one thing you don't do is begin to defend yourself. If you're going to make a friendship right, don't defend anything you did. Just say, I was dead wrong. I'm very sorry, and I'm asking for forgiveness. Specifically, I'm wrong, I was wrong, and I'm asking for forgiveness. And then what you might do is ask them, listen, would you tell me, tell me what can I do to heal this relationship? Tell me what I need to do to make this relationship right. Tell me what I need to do to rebuild our fellowship and our and our friendship because I love you as my friend. I made a mistake. I'm sorry. And if you'll tell me what I can do to make this better, I will do it. And what you're doing is you're opening the door for them to uh, say whatever they need to say. And, th and they may say to you, well, you can do something real simple. 
If I tell you something in confidence, don't ever tell anybody else if you want this friendship to work. It may be something that simple, or it may be something uh, more difficult than that. But we have to give them an opportunity to say what needs to be said if I want to mend that relationship. And if I don't want to mend it, I'll say, well, you know, everybody makes mistakes. And if you, if you think my mistake was so much, then forget the friendship. No, that's not friendship. But you care about the friendship. Friendships are precious. And if you'll think about it, your whole life, and you know how long I've lived, I could count on true, genuine friends that I've had. Thank God it would take both hands and feet, all toes. I've had some wonderful friends, and I've outlived a lot of them. And, um, but my, I can say this. The best friends that I've ever had in my life, I have today. And so I would say that to all you folks out there who or at my age and above that, or below that, or whatever it might be. Don't think because you are whatever age you are that, you know, nobody wants to be your friend. Sure, listen. Most all of my friends are half my age. You say, and they're running around with you? Yep. <laughs> and you know what? They love it. <laughs> because they're wise enough to listen and learn something. And I love them. I, you know, the age has nothing to do with it. It has to do with what you have to offer. What kind of friend do you want to be? And I would have been happy at the age of 40 to have somebody who is my dear friend at the age of 80. I thought, listen, I want to learn everything I can, listen to what I can listen to, and be sure I don't miss anything in life that will help me become the person God wants me to be. We can, we can mend friendships if we're honest and open willing to ask for forgiveness, apologize, and whatever it might be. And I can tell you at this point in my life, the best friends, the truest friends I've ever had are my friends today. And so that ought to be an encouragement to some of you. Maybe your friends, you think, well, I thought you ought to have, your closest friends ought to be your age. No, because people my age can't keep up with me. They can't. <laughs> they can't. <laughs> It's hard for them to be my friends. So I have to choose those who can go when I want to go and go where I want to go and do the things I love doing. But you, you may want to choose friends who are totally different. I understand that. So what you have to ask is this. How valuable are my friends? And the value you place on your friends will be evidenced by the way you treat your friends. Nothing you say, it's the way you treat them. And the wonderful thing about friendship is this. Jesus is the best friend you and I'll ever have. And my friend, no matter who your friends are and what you have in life and where you've been, where you're going, your popularity and prestige and prominence and all the rest, None of that weighs as much as a good friend. And you start with Jesus, who's always there. And if you'll notice that paragraph we gave at the beginning of the message, he fits every bit of that. He's a true friend. And listen, when we say he's there when all the world walks out, I think that's the ultimate test of a friend today. When everybody else walks away from you, Who's standing there with you to say, you can count on me no matter what? That's the kind of friend I want to be, and that's the kind of friend I'd like to have. And Father, we thank you and praise you today for your loving friendship toward us. You put up with a lot. You provide us everything, and you're so generous to us. And we ask today that you place within our heart the desire to be the kind of friend so many people need. You've brought us from multitudes of places, different backgrounds, but you've surrounded all of us with different people, many of whom need a friend. Teach us how to be a godly friend, that being our friend will draw them closer to you. It's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. The blessings of godly relationships can be yours through faith in Jesus. 
the best friend you'll ever have. At InTouch.org, learn more about trusting God and how to discern His will for your life. There you can see today's message, Thinking Through Your Friendships, and find a library of free and inspiring messages from Dr. Stanley, sermon notes, and resources to help you learn how to be a godly influence to people in your life.